Let me get in the word this morning because uh, I know it's Sunday morning. I'm going to turn to the 10th chapter of Luke, if you'll bring that up on the screen for me. And I want to begin in verse number 25, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version. I'm trying to get used to more a little bit uh, the New King James, and so I think it's a little bit easier to understand than all the these, the thous, and sometimes you get lost in all of that, and I, I appreciate this translation. I appreciate a lot of them. Hallelujah. But let's begin reading. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, before you go to the next verse, let me just say that how many know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, but they are still in the Old Covenant. I didn't even get anybody but one guy shaking his head, yeah. I mean, the cross was the pivotal point that inaugurated a brand new covenant. How many of the new covenant is not an addendum to the old one? How many know it is a completely different covenant? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel after those days. I uh, recently was in uh, a church in Charleston, and uh, I, I preached from the verse where the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth does not mean you know Greek and Hebrew, although I'm not opposed to that. Rightly dividing the word of truth knows you know, means you simply know how to discern what is truth in relationship to the old covenant and what is truth in relationship to the new covenant. Can you see that that would be rightly dividing the word of truth? And how many know what we do a lot of times is what the apostle Paul called a perversion of the gospel. We, we mix and match the parts of the law that fit our culture, and we call that the gospel, but it's not the gospel. It's a mixture. Paul calls it a perversion of the gospel. As a matter of fact, he tells them in the book of Galatians, the only way you can fall from grace is to go back up under the law. How many know that he was made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law? How many of some of the stuff we've been redeemed from is not just sin, we've been redeemed from the curse of the law? That's some good news right there. And rightly dividing goes to show us how this works. So this lawyer, Jesus is the probably one, but not probably, he is the most vivid, uh, you know, uh, vivid uh, teacher of the new covenant. He's the most pivotal character in human history because he's coming to challenge how they are thinking in this particular time slot. He would say things in Matthew 5 like, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for two, a tooth. How many know that's, an old covenant of scripture. You have heard it said. And then he stops and says, but I say unto you. So he's establishing himself as the mediator of a better covenant. How many know the whole book of Hebrews is what's better about the new covenant than the old covenant? How many know it's got better blood, better promises, a better tabernacle, it's got a better priesthood, it's got better offerings? It's got a, a more excellent way, a more excellent ministry. It's got a better rest, a better faith. Everything about the new covenant is better. How many know under the old covenant, it says thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And the new covenant says, God says, I will, I will, I will, I will, and I will. Come on, somebody. How many know under the old covenant, it's what you did. You can sorry to give him a hand. Hallelujah. That's something to clap about right there. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you believe it. Because under the old covenant, it was what about what you did. And in the new covenant, it's about what God did in Christ. I've been teaching right now. We're in a series on the book of Romans, and we're doing it chapter by chapter. And I love the message Bible in, in, in Romans chapter 4 where it talks about Abraham. It said, this is not an Abraham story. This was a God story. Abraham simply entered by faith into what God was doing for him instead of what he was doing for God. I mean, that's a massive shift in the way you think. And so what happens is, is we see that the new covenant is full of supply and the old covenant is full of demand. And so here we have a lawyer who's coming to Jesus. Now, this is not a lawyer like our secular lawyers. These are guys who are expert in the law of Moses and they've figured out all of the legal loopholes in the law of Moses. And, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they were trying to trap Jesus up because, first of all, he is made of a woman, made under the law. So he's going to fulfill everything the law has. And then as a spotless, innocent lamb of God, he's going to go to the cross and become a curse for us to redeem us from the curse of the law that we might receive an inheritance. 
So when this lawyer is asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The first thing that hits my mind is number one, you don't do anything to inherit. How many know an inheritance means somebody died and left you something? This lady on the front seat has a Bible. Would you raise it just for a moment? And just hold it up just there. See, this, this right here is a copy of my heavenly father's last will and testament. Do you have a copy of your father's will and testament? How I many know a testament is a will? And he wrote an old testament one day, and then he had a son. And this son was such an incredible businessman that the father got richer. And the father had so much fun with this first son that he said, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring many sons into glory, so I'm going to have to revise the will because i got some more kids. I wish you'd touch your neighbor and tell him somebody died and left you something. Hallelujah. <laughs> touch somebody else and tell him it might not hurt you to read your copy of the will. <laughs> you might ought to tell somebody else you're settling out of court if you don't read your copy of the will. And how many know the devil will beat you out of your share of the will? Come on, somebody. But how many know not only did Jesus die so you could get what's in the will? I love this. Because the book of Hebrews said without the death of the testator, the will is not effective. So he made the New Testament effective, the New Covenant effective, by the death of the testator without blood, there was no, there was no, uh, there, uh, every covenant was sealed with blood. So he died so what you could get what's in the will. Somebody died and left you something. That's some good news right there. Hallelujah. And in my copy of the will, it tells me that I have an inheritance. I, 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 I'm an heir of the grace of life. I'm, I'm Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Healing is the children's bread. Blessing, come on, hallelujah. Deuteronomy 10, I says, I'll give you the days of heaven on earth, not just when you die. See, what our problem is, is we think heaven is all we inherit. But now let me just stretch you just a bit this morning. When this lawyer is asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I want to just stretch you for a moment, but let me preface what I'm going to say before I do that by saying this. Say this with me. He believes eternal life includes going to heaven when you die. Do we have that settled? But one of, my, one of my favorite writers that I read a lot is N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright was translating some things. He's a scholar, one of the most read scholars right now, I think. But he translated some of these verses because this Greek word for eternal here is the Greek word aeonian or the coming age. So he's saying to him, not only there's a ticket to heaven, but he's saying that what must I do to inherit the life of the coming age? Now, I see, I feel myself getting real eschatological here this morning. But how many know the age that he was talking about was not when you get to heaven somewhere? How many know eternal life does not begin when you die? How many know it began when he died and you received that life? Come on, somebody. How many know you already got eternal life? So for us living on this side, how many know that age was coming to an end? The apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. And he says to that first century church, you are the people upon whom the ends, plural, of the ages, plural, have now come. That's a powerful statement. He says that to a first century church at Corinth, and he tells them, you are the people upon whom the ends of the ages have now come. And if you can picture this, if I had a chalkboard this morning, I wasn't intending on throwing this in here, but here we go. If you can picture, can you see the circle in your mind here? Can you see the circle? Just a picture of this. And I'm going to draw another circle over here and overlap them, and it will look like, if you can picture in your mind, the MasterCard insignia, where these two circles overlap. Can you see that in your mind? Come on, somebody say, don't leave home without it. <laughs> and right where these two circles converge, there is a 40-year transition period where one covenant is fading away called the New Testament. And all the writers of the New Testament write most of their books during this 40-year transition period. But here's what I want you to see. It was the, if this circle here represents the old covenant age, 
and this circle represents the new covenant age right here where these two ages converge is the back end of the old covenant age and the front end of the new covenant age hence they were at the ends of the ages for the old covenant people they were at the end of the old covenant age and for us that are beyond that how many know it was the beginning of the age that we now live in how many is glad we're in a new covenant age and so that you and I have inherited the life come on hallelujah not just a trip to heaven but we've inherited the life of the coming age which is a life lived Jesus said this is let me he, let me tell you, Jesus defines eternal life like this he said this is life eternal that you would know God the Father and the Son so that the life of the coming age was a life lived in the context of a relationship with a father who's a good, good father. Come on, somebody. He's not an austere old man on a Victorian chair ready to slap you upside the head. He is a good father who has given us not only eternal life to get us to heaven, but he's given us a life, come on, that we can live right now of righteousness, peace, and joy located in the Holy Ghost because the kingdom of heaven is not where you go when you die. It's where you went when you were born again. And we'll say things like this, but we don't really grasp what we're saying. Somebody comes to an altar, gives their heart to Jesus, and receives the free gift of salvation. We'll go, well, the angels of God are rejoicing because another soul just entered the kingdom. I mean, that's exactly what happened. Is you stepped out of the kingdom of darkness, and you became a citizen of the kingdom of God right now. Hallelujah. I get excited about that. See, it's in my copy of the will. I get to inherit a life. How I many know he didn't just come to, to, to give a, a death, he came to give us a life. And so when we receive this life, it is the life that of course has eternal aspects that we get to live in heaven someday. But the reality of it is, is that we get to walk in this planet as ambassadors and sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with a mission and a ministry of reconciliation to tell the world that God has already been reconciled to you. You need to respond to him by being reconciled to him. That God is not mad with you, he's mad about you. That's good news this morning. Hallelujah. And so, you know, the reality of it is, is that you got an inheritance. Somebody died and left you something. But this is what I love. The writer of the book of Hebrews says he got back up from the dead to be the administrator of his own will to make sure you get what he said you could have. Hallelujah. So not only can you, do you have a will, it's hard to lose when the administrator got back up from the dead and said, this is what I meant by that. You're going to get everything. I feel the Holy Ghost in here this morning. And all you need to do is believe what he said and access this grace by faith and you draw it out of the realm of the invisible into the realm of the visible. And what happens is we start to receive inheritance, not just when we die, but we start to receive inheritance as we walk in the blessing and the promise of Abraham by faith because it's a God story and not a living story. Man, that's worth shouting about this morning. So this lawyer is asking Jesus because he's a performance-based dude. He's, a, he's one of these guys still under an old covenant paradigm who's really, you know, most of the persecution, let me calm down a little bit. I feel like preaching here this morning. Most of the, the persecution that happened in the New Testament didn't so much come from the Roman government as it came from the religious rulers and leaders of the synagogues because Jesus has preached a message that's diametrically opposed to what they're trying to produce. And they're persecuting him because they figure if this guy is right, we're out of a job. We don't need to sacrifice any more bulls or goats or sheep. Come on. We don't have to go through all of these rituals. And if this guy is right, we better fight. We better kill this dude or he's going to put us out of business. Now, I want to show you this story as we go down through this. This lawyer is asking Jesus, what do I need to do in order to inherit? So if you ask Jesus under an old covenant what you got to do, he's going to, of course, give you the rules. The bottom line is this, though. The end of the law is this. There's none righteous, Romans 3. No, not even one. Not even Moses, who was the mediator of that covenant, made it in by the works of the law. Now, I, I could chase rabbits all morning this morning and show you that later Moses, kind of who only asked God for two things, said, let me see your glory and show me the promised land. Looked to me like it's pretty unfair that Moses missed it because he spent 40 years in Egyptian schools. 
He was the heir apparent to the throne of Ramesses, and then he spent another 40 years in the wilderness learning how to be a pastor, keeping sheep, got him a wife named Zipporah, probably called her Zippy. <laughs> He's 80 years old when he goes into the ministry. Touch your neighbor, say it's not too late for you. 80 years old. And God calls him to take four, about three to four million people on a 40-year camping trip, and these people don't even want to go camping. These people are not just your everyday belly-aching murmurers like it's hot out here, they're sand in my shoes, somebody stole my tent peg. These are the kind of people that get up and angels are delivering them breakfast in bed in the morning on their lawn. They are delivering manna. Now, you would think at some point when angels are delivering you breakfast, God might just be for us. I want to chase a lot of rabbits here this morning. But how many know the Bible says they murmured about the manna, and the Bible said that this manna had the taste of fresh oil and honeycomb. Angels were delivering Krispy Kreme donuts on the lawn every morning. And they were healthy. They were good for you. If I can find this recipe, I am a rich man. Hallelujah. And these people have the audacity to complain, we loathe this light bread. So much so that these murmuring people, God says to Moses, get up out the road. I'm going to kill every one of them. I'm going to raise up a seed out of you, and I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And, and, and they got on God's last nerve. And Moses stands up as a mediator. He said, God, if you've got to heal them, you've got to kill me. And he became a mediator as a picture of Christ who stood up in the gap. How many is glad for a mediator? Hallelujah. But the thing I'm after is that it looks like Moses fouls up just one time. One time he fails to sanctify the Lord his God and smites the rock rather than speak the word concerning the rock. And God tells him, he's only ever asked God for two things. Let me see your glory. Show me the promised land. That's all he's ever asked God for. And he's almost 120 years old. And he comes to the end of his wilderness journey. And God says, I can't, I can't let you come into the promised land. Because you failed to sanctify me. And that used to frustrate me. I thought, God, why? that just does not look fair to me. And really what was behind my thinking with that is, well, if Moses didn't make it and he fouled up one time, Homeboy don't got a chance. Because I've already failed. Come on, messed up one time. This morning. Because, I mean, under the law, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. So nobody makes it. I want you to see that about Moses. Nobody makes it on the basis of the law. And I, I could do a whole lot of stuff about, with that. Uh, but I just tell you this, just because it used to, I say, God, that just does not seem fair to me that Moses only ever asked you for two things. Let me see your glory and show me the promised land. And so he dies and God buries him in a place where nobody knows where he's at to this day. And that's a whole other message for me. But wait, in the New Testament, that prayer request of Moses is ringing throughout the quarters of glory. It is haunting God. Let me see your glory. Show me the promised land. And on a mountain called Transfiguration, Pastor Farley, God said, go get Jacob's ladder. Moses is about to re-enter the theater of human expression on a mountain called Transfiguration. And when he comes down the mountain and he looks at Jesus in the face, he realizes glory is not smoke in the corner. It's found in the face of Jesus Christ. And prayer request number one is answered. Hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, he, it dawns on him, the promised land is not a place it's a person. It's in him that all of God's promises are yes and amen. So God answers the promises and the prayer request of Moses that he could not have under an old covenant. Come on, somebody. And on a mountain called Transfiguration, we have the law, Moses, and Elijah, the prophets, the law, and the prophets are being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, and inheritance is coming through the one to whom the promise was made, the seed of Abraham, not the seeds as of many, but one seed, and your seed, which is Christ. And God delivered him to the promise, and since you, are in I, uh, you and I are in Christ, we are heirs of the promise. Do you realize how rich this will is? I don't think we've ever really wrapped our head around all the promises, or nor have we executed the will. 
That's why if you know if you have attorneys in here this morning, uh, some I want my attorney gave me a document he had did in court, and, and he said when I finished my case, he said at the end of it he said, we th this was a statement. He said these things we pray the court. I did not know that was a legal term. We pray the court prayer. Every time you enter into prayer, a legal docket enters the kingdom of heaven and your attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous, picks it up. He ever lives to litigate and he is your defense counsel. He is not the prosecuting attorney. Somebody ought to shout about that about right now. He is for you. He is not against you. Hallelujah. Now, what I want you to see, I don't want to chase that rabbit about that, but what I want you to see is that this this lawyer is asking Jesus, what must I do to inherit the life of the coming age? And he said to him, what is written in the law? I'm coming back here to the verse now. What, what is it? How do you read it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Now, let me just stop for a moment because I want to just make this point. I really felt this hit my heart this morning as I was meditating on preaching this. Jesus elevates worship uh, to the equivalent of not just coming into a church service and singing a song in worship because in other places he says, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember there that you have ought against your brother, go first of all be reconciled to your brother. So what he's doing is he's elevating worship. Uh, uh, he, let me say it like this. He is elevating how you treat your neighbor to the same level as worship. In other words, we don't think of worship as how I treat you. But how many know as much as you've done it to the least of these little ones, you've done it to me? So how many know what you do, come on, when you go and you help the widow lady that can't fix her step, and you go fix that step, or you take the unwed mother a bag of groceries, or you find someone who's in need or you treat your neighbor who's struggling with addiction and you reach out to him how many know what he's saying is that's part of worship have you ever thought of it like that come on how many know that's part of our worship and to me worship is not just something we do on sunday that we go through a ritual it's how we kind of because how many know that the only way you can have a tangible touch of how we treat him is how we treat one another. If you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? So he is really reducing. He's literally putting this on the same level. Am I making sense to you this morning? Now this lawyer comes back and said, but he wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, then who is my neighbor? Now how many know what happens is next is we start looking for the legal loopholes in the law. We, 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 we're looking for how can I justify myself? I don't know if you've ever really read, uh, the, I call it the book of Deuteronomy. Because it's more about what you Deuteronomy than you do Deuteronomy. And even the guys who preach stuff that I grew up on where they picked and choose the parts, I can remember especially the text in Deuteronomy, women don't dress in men's apparel. Now, how, I can remember how they said that, though, brothers. See, they lean back and say, women, ha, don't dress in men's apparel. Ha, you're going to bust hell wide open. You came in here. You know? <laughs> and, and our holiness was based on what we had on in, in our outfit. But we never read the rest of it. Don't mingle your thread in a garment with diverse kinds of thread. I never heard anybody ever preach against a polyester rayon blend. <laughs> Next verse. It says, do not mingle wool and linen together. That's in your Bible. You cannot mingle. That means if you got on a wool suit and cotton underwear, you're going to bust hell wide open this morning the way we preach it. <laughs> you couldn't touch a pig skin. That means you can't even play football. Not only not touch it, you couldn't eat a pork chop, bacon, or sausage gravy. And some of you sitting up in here this morning with sausage gravy on your breath. Hallelujah. And you wonder why God ain't moving in the chair. You know. You can't eat a catfish, a shrimp. In other words, there is so many rules. You can't mingle your seed in the field with diverse kinds of seed. In other words, we pick and choose the parts of the law that fit our culture, and we call that the gospel. I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful this morning that I'm not up under the law. I'm up under a new and better covenant that's not about performance or what i got to do to inherit. He did it so I could get it. Come on. He get it to give it to me as a free gift in the new covenant. Righteousness is not based on did you cross every T and dot every I. 
it is based on a gift. The free, because of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You didn't do anything to deserve it. He said, I'm just going to do this incredible, extravagant thing. I'm going to do something on the cross that's going to make every man, woman, boy, and girl righteous and in right standing with me so that I'm not alienated to them. And all they got to do to receive the blessing of that is receive by faith what I've given them by grace. And they'll start to a brain in life. That's the kingdom word. They'll start to live in the kingdom right now, reigning in life. Because what we have in the new covenant is we have the spirit of God inside of us that is governing us and leading us and supplying for us everything we need even to walk this life. I'm, I'm telling you, this is a win-win situation here. I have no idea. I have people that resist us a lot of times. They want to they fight about I said, you know what? Knock yourself out. That's all I can tell you. Paul said, yeah, tell me, you who have been under the law, or been on being under the law, do you hear what the law really says? And then he starts going down through this, and he talks about, well, I, I don't want to chase all these rabbits this morning, but I, let me just give you this example. Got a lot to say this morning. Hallelujah. I, I tell the story about many years ago, AJ was traveling with me. He came here. Some of you remember AJ, who came from an Italian mob family. And the first time I ever preached some, uh, the, the, you know, beginning to really understand some things about the new covenant, I was in peculiar Missouri. And uh, I, I said to AJ, I said, I want you to come up and help me run a prayer line down. He said, you want me to help you, boss? I said, yeah, I want you to help me. And I said, do you have an ink pen? He said, yeah. I said, well, I want you to come here and stand because I'm, we're going to sing just as I am without one plea. And I, I read the scripture, said, if your eye offends you, poke it out. I said, I want you to poke eyes out for people who are struggling. And Jesus does that right underneath of the lust scripture y'all looking at me funny i said i want you to poke some eyes out and everybody looked at me like you you're gonna poke an eye out what? jesus said if you're out offended, you poke that bad boy out i sent somebody to the kitchen to get a meat cleaver and i said now, he said if your hand offends you cut it off so we got a line over here for hand cutting so how about hand cutting eye poking and foot chopping line going here and nobody's getting my line pastors to if I had a line for prosperity or blessings, it would all lined up, but nobody's getting in my eye poking line because this ain't the first time he ever maybe poked an eye out. <laughs> and then I said, I need one more knife. And it was amazing to me, the women were the ones that were armed to the teeth. There's a lady there with blue hair, had a nine millimeter in her pocketbook. Hallelujah. <laughs> And this lady, she said, Brother House, I got, I got a knife. And she pulls out this little, uh, you know, uh, uh, Swiss Army knife, you know. She says, you can borrow my knife. And I said, I need one more volunteer. And the guy on my far right, little old uh, gentleman that was up in years, he said, uh, I'll help you, Dr. House. So I got an eye poking line, a hand chopping line, and a foot, choking, a foot chopping line. He said, but he reached in his hip pocket and he pulled out what looked like a crocodile and Dundee knife, threw that bad boy open. He says, but that ain't a knife, this is a knife. I said, well, I want you to run my circumcision line because if you're going to keep the law, you've got to be circumcised. <laughs> when I got to the circumcision line, uh, Pastor Beavers, everybody in the place goes, Brother Howes, we're not under the law. I said, mission accomplished. <laughs> you ought to clap about that. <laughs> what I'm trying to get you to see is we need to understand context, audience relevance, and what he's trying to get them to see when he's teaching some of this. Because even in Matthew 5, where Jesus taught that, he talked about a righteousness that would exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, and the only righteousness that exceeds that is the righteousness that's by faith, that for by one offering, he has sanctified us by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, hallelujah. And he has sanctified us and perfected forever them that are sanctified. Our perfection and our sanctification is not based on our performance, it's based on what he did in order to make me holy. Can you get over a big hand about that? Can, can I just, I probably have, maybe have demonstrated this before, but you come help me just a minute, student, and Brother Beavers, and, and uh, uh, come on, uh, Louis, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just show you something. Under the old covenant, if, if uh, Brother Beavers wants to get to God, under the old covenant, the only way you can get to God is you have got to, because of the sin that you've got, you have to bring a woolly lamb. Now, I want you to get Stuart, and, and he, he's going to be, your, your woolly lamb. You want to say, you want to say, bah. Bah. I should make him cluck like a chicken, but I won't. Hell so Brother Beavers has gotten himself a lamb because that's the only approach without the shedding of blood. There's not any remission. 
So he brings the lamb to the high priest. Now, Louis is the high priest. See, I did that to keep you all off. I made him the lamb. Hallelujah. Now, Brother Beavers is the sinner. Hallelujah. Does he, does he fit the mold? Hallelujah. Now, Brother Beavers, in order to get to God, has got to take this lamb, and you're going to lay your hands on the head of this lamb, and you're going to confess your sin. <laughs> did you see that deer in the head? Like, look, we don't have all morning. And he confesses his sin because he's laying on him your iniquity. And then he hands his lamb to the high priest. Step back now. Hallelujah. And the high priest will examine the lamb. Would you examine the lamb and make a statement concerning it as the high priest? What have you discovered? It's pure. It's a spotless, pure lamb. Yes, yes. Without blemish, it's spotless. Even Pilate, who was the Roman, he said, this is innocent blood. And he watches this. Judas who was a devil, had to testify in this court case. Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. Hallelujah. This is a spotless, spotless, incorruptible lamb of God. But what I want you to see is even under the old covenant, the sinner is not examined the lamb is examined behold the lamb of god but what we do every sunday morning is we examine the sinner and we tell you how bad you are and how bad you failed and how disqualified you are and all the reasons god is mad with you but in the new covenant you're accepted not on the basis of how good you are but on the basis of a spotless lamb your sanctification and perfection hallelujah somebody ought to shout hallelujah give these guys a hand as they say Hallelujah. Let me quickly get down because there's so much I want to say here. This guy is willing to justify himself, so he's looking for the legal loopholes in the law. How many can see the powerful picture I'm trying to show you this morning? I don't know if that, that I don't know what that does to you, but when I see that example of the lamb, it jerks a praise up out of me. It makes me want to stand and say, you are worthy, lamb, because you have taken to yourself great power and you've reigned. He was the ultimate sacrifice forever that by one offering he has sanctified and perfected forever. Read Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Them, hallelujah, that are, are receiving the gift, of, this gift of righteousness. Now, let me just go down through this just a little bit. And show you, let me bring up, uh, let me finish this scripture. And then, we'll, we'll, then Jesus answered, said, a certain man when he asks something willing to justify himself, I mean, you know, based on what we've done and who we are in our natural man, there's none of us who are justified in the sight of God by the works of the law. How many of you believe that this morning? That's about as clear as I know how to make it. No flesh is justified on the basis of their performance. Nobody, not even Moses made it. If you think you can, knock yourself out. Hallelujah. Then Jesus answered, because this guy wanted to, he said, who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departing, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Everybody say priest. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to Rama Christian Center in Lewisburg to take care of him. He brought him to an inn. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? He said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now let me just, uh, just unpack this a little bit this morning. He said there was a certain man that came down to Jericho and he found this guy who was wounded and dying. Go ahead and bring me up John chapter 10 if you would. I, I touched this last night, but I'm going to bring it up in and deal with it here this morning. Let me see where I'm at time-wise. Hallelujah. John 10, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way. Say this with me. Some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. Some other way. Next verse. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Next verse. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Next verse. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep 
follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. Next verse. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Next verse. And Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. This is a full chapter in my book back there on the, one of the I am's that Jesus says. I am the door of the sheep. Next verse. And whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. Say this with me. Some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. See, I want to point this out because this guy that's bleeding and dying beside the Jericho Road has been left bleeding and dying by thieves. The mentality this man has is there's some other way into the sheepfold than through the door. Now, the, day, the way this lawyer thought was the way through the door is, I'm a glow-in-the-dark holy dude, and I'm better than you are. He thought that's the way, performance. Next verse, all whoever came before me are thieves. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, and he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Next verse, for the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. My TV program is named from this ver verse that you might have life. Because he says, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. For the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Now, I don't want to shock you this morning because I know that we've got mindsets that are, are, are always connected to something we've heard over and over and over. But the thief of John 10 is not the devil. I got the amen from the pastor. The rest of you didn't say a thing. The thief of John, the devil is never mentioned in John 10. The thief of John 10 is when you think there's some other way into the sheepfold other than through the door. Every other way that you think you have will rob you. Can I tell you growing up in well-meaning, well-meaning classical Pentecost and religious systems from pastors who literally celebrated ignorance, and I'm, I'm trying to be respectful because you know I, I can remember them almost celebrating. I didn't go to no cemetery. And the truth of it is they couldn't really read good and they were preaching something they heard somebody else say. Well, thank you for that thunder, say, man. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but what I'm saying is what it did was it preached a religion to me that became a thief to me. Because religion will rob you. Relationship with Jesus will give you back your life. I, if you saw the letters that we receive, even from pastors and people from all over the world saying, this message you declare saved my life, saved my marriage, saved my ministry. Because once you realize that this is not about keeping a bunch of rules, the gospel is not a rule you have to keep. It's a relationship with a living savior. Under the law, it's a law you have to keep. In the new covenant, you receive a life that'll keep you. In the old covenant, again, it was thou shalt, thou shalt not. In the new covenant, God says, I will, I will, I will, and I will. In other words, the, the old is demand, the new is supply. What I believe happened, and I could go back and talk about my history. And once again, I say with respect, because those guys that I uh, grew up under did the best they could with what they knew. But I think it's time for reformation in the church these days. It's more than just a shout and a hookamashai. We need to bring our brain and come to church and be transformed by the renewing of our minds because when you start to realize how accepted and loved you are, all the bleeding's going to stop. Because what happened to me as a young man was every Sunday morning we would come to church and find out what's wrong with us and how bad we were, and I got saved every week and gave them a midweek courtesy dip because they talked me out of my salvation about the time I thought I was saved they come up with a new sin and everything would take you to hell back there including watching a little house on the prairie hallelujah <laughs> are you follow, are you tracking with me in my seventh uh, my, uh, my in my high school years we were forced to, to opt out of uh, uh, physical education jeopardized my high school diploma because it was a sin to take physical education because you had to wear shorts to do it and what happened to me was, as a teenager, I got to the place where I thought, I love this God, but he don't love me. But I, you know, if, and, and then somebody would come and say, well, what do you all believe about that church? I said, well, we don't believe you should wear shorts. We don't believe you should watch TV. We don't believe you should wear, you know, certain kinds of outfits. We don't believe women should wear makeup. We don't believe. And I, I'm sharing this with somebody, and they're asking me, what do you all believe? And I'm telling them all the stuff we don't believe. I thought, it dawned on me. I've been to church my whole life. I've become an unbeliever. 
because they never taught me anything to believe because Galatians 3 said the law shuts up faith. I couldn't even believe I was saved. And it became a thief to me because it was the some other way to enter into life than through the door. Am I tra are you tracking with me this morning? See, you may not be ready for this if you're, if you're the religious lawyer, but if you've already been down this, come on, religious treadmill and you're laying beside of a road, bleeding and dying, this Samaritan comes by and picks you up and takes you to an inn. Come on, somebody. He brings you to Rama Center in Lewisburg, West Virginia, come on, an inn and says, whatever it costs to make you better, I'm willing to pay the price. And if I come back and owe you anything more, I'll pay it then. In other words, what he's saying is whatever it takes to get you whole and to give you back your life, I'm willing to pay that price. You ought to put your hands together if you believe it this morning. I might add here that even the Samaritan in this story is actually Jesus himself because a Samaritan was somebody who was half Jewish and half something else. And I don't want to make nobody mad here this morning, but Jesus was not 100% Jewish. I'm sorry. He just wasn't. He was a, they, a matter of fact, the Pharisees called him a Samaritan because he was Jewish on his mother's side. You're not tracking with me yet. But he was not Jewish on his father's side. Y'all ain't tracking with me yet. His mother was a Jew. His father was God. Come on, somebody. That would make him part Jewish and part divine. Are y'all with me? Hallelujah. Are, are you tracking with me? So he's the, he's the Samaritan. He's the guy they all hate. And so, you know, let me just say this to you. Under the okay, bring up my 2 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 3, verse, I believe it is verse number 7. This is from the Message Bible. It says, the government of death... Look at this. The government of death, its constitution was chiseled on stone tablets. How many know that's the law? Not my words. This is translated from the message translation. Your Bible, you read King James, it's virtually the same. The government of death, its constitution was chiseled on stone tablets. It had a dazzling inaugural. Moses' face as he delivered the tablets was, next verse, so bright that day that even though it would fade soon enough that the people of Israel could no more look right at him than to stare into the sun, how much more dazzling, I love this, how much more dazzling than the government of living spirits. So how many of the old covenant was the government of death chiseled on stone tablets, but the new covenant kingdom of God, which you're a citizen in, is a government of living spirit. So under the covenant, old covenant, you were governed by rules on rocks. In the new covenant, you're governed by Holy Spirit. So instead of just being full of demand, go ahead and put your hands together. That's, that's something to clap about. Is that the Holy Spirit is to the new covenant what the law was to the old And I can show you parallels that when they came out of Egypt and they 50 days after they're delivered by the blood of a spotless lamb at the foot of Mount Sinai. 50 days exactly after they left Egypt at the foot of Mount Sinai. God gives them the law. He comes down on the mountain. Cloud covers the mountain. The people are afraid of God. God gives them the law. And 3,000 people drop dead. In the New Testament, exactly 50 days after Jesus is the real Lamb of God, is crucified, they're in an upper room. And 50 is the number of Pentecost. And that's why it said when the day of Pentecost was fully come is because Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover. And exactly 50 days after Jesus, the real lamb, was sacrificed, they're in an upper room. But this time, God don't give them rules on rocks. This time, God gives them the Holy Ghost. And they start to speak with new tongues. And all of a sudden, they realize 3,000 are added to the church. Why? Because under the old covenant, the letter kills. In the new covenant, the spirit gives life. Now, let me show you this parallel. Let me just show you. You're going to think I'm preaching the law here for a minute, but let's go back to the, uh, give me my Leviticus text, if you would. Leviticus 21. We're getting there. Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. Next verse. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. A man blind or lame or has a marred face or any limb too long. A man who has a broken foot or a broken hand. 
or is hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or is a eunuch. Next verse. That's probably far enough. It goes on to, to that's, that's far enough. Now, let me just tell you, the, the way I used to preach this, this, how many can see this is an Old Testament scripture that's about what you disqualifies you? Can I tell you that the problem right now all over the world is the church has become more famous for what we're against than what we're for? And people see us as an us against them, and that creates wars everywhere rather than what do I need to do to reach my hand out as a neighbor that you can get better. In other words, we got to stop seeing people as enemies and start seeing them as broken. Because the bottom line is broken people is all there is. Now, when I used to preach this years ago when I was a legalist, I would say all of this stuff is the stuff that disqualifies you. Now, King James, the regular King James, talks about a flat nose or uh, you know, a crooked foot. And I used to preach it like this, Pastor Stu. I'd say, if you've got a club foot, and I'd, 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 hump, I'd stagger across the stage like, if you got a club foot, uh, it's cause you ain't walking in holiness, uh, and you ain't walking the straight and narrow, and you're disqualified from eating the bread of your God. Uh, if you got a flat nose, uh, it's cause you got nose trouble, and you got your nose in everybody else's business. That'll preach, hallelujah. <laughs> Your discerner is off. You can't smell. You can't sense. You got to sense. If you got a withered hand, it's because uh, you ain't doing nothing for God. You're powerless, and your your your, your fivefold ministry is powerless, and it's weak, and it's no good for anything. If you got a hunch back, uh, it's because you've been looking down at the realm of the earth, and all you can see is how bad it is, and how big the devil is, and what's going on in the earth, and woe is me. And uh, come on, watching the news twenty four seven a day. Uh, until you're so depressed you don't know what to do. Uh, if you got a scab or a running sore, it's cause you got a grudge against your brother and you got something in your life and there's sin in your life and God has disqualified you from eating the bread of your God and you are disqualified. If you got a, a, a problem with your eye, it's because your eye is not single and you got double vision and you full of, you got a mold in your eye. And I, man, that stuff would preach, boy. It didn't preach, it would preach until I'd have everybody in the altar. But the whole time I'm preaching that, I was disqualifying myself. But what I want you to see, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to turn to every scripture here, but what I want you to see is, I love this. Jesus, who was the ultimate priest, comes on the scene, and every miracle he does, this is in my book called Unforced Rhythms of Grace, every miracle he does, he handpicks all of these that were disqualified under the old covenant and heals them. Come on, somebody. He finds, come on, Brother Louis, a hunchback woman bowed to the earth. And she could in no wise lift up herself. And the Bible said she was in that condition for 18 years. 18 is the number of bondage. It's also, if I could just make this little quick statement, it's also, if you count it, 6 plus 6 plus 6, it's the number of the beast. Now, I don't have this book with me, but I wrote my first book in 1993. It was called Beauty and the Beast. And in that book, I show how in Revelation, the number of the beast is not written with Greek numbers. It was written with Greek number, letters that have a numerical value of 666. And then I started discovering that there are words in the Bible that have numerical value from the Greek language. In other words, it's, it's, it's amazing the mathematician that God is. But here's the first word that has a numerical value of 666 in the scriptures in the New Testament is the word tradition. The word tradition is where Jesus said, you have made the word of God ineffective by your tradition. And while we're waiting on Osama, Obama, Chelsea's mama, or the last Trump in White House to be the beast, help me, Holy Ghost, maybe we need to look at religious tradition and say it looks like a lamb, but it talks like a dragon. Well, thanks for that thunderous amen right there. And let me tell you what happens. The moment you start messing with tradition, people will fight you. They know what the songbook says, but they don't know what the Bible says. You start mentioning, well, we've always done it this way. I've seen churches split over whether or not they could open the curtains in the building because we hadn't done that for 50 years. 
did we move the sacrament table? We've got traditions, come on, that have made. And what has happened is that these traditions have kept people focused in the wrong direction and bowed to the earth. But I love that Jesus, under the old covenant, this woman was disqualified from the bread of God. But Jesus, who is the true bread, walks up to her. And I love this. He defaults to a covenant that preceded the Mosaic covenant. And he says, ought not this woman, who's a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from this infirmity? On the Sabbath day, what he does is he defaults to a covenant that preceded the one that disqualified you and showed you the true bread that came down from heaven. Did not come to disqualify you. It came, come on, hallelujah, to set you free. And he looks at her and says, woman, thou art loosed from this infirmity. And he did it on the Sabbath day, which was against their law. They couldn't see that Jesus just healed somebody. All they can see is he broke the rules. He healed on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees are like, you know what? There are six days in which men ought to be healed. And Jesus turns around and said, you know what? You would lose your ox or your ass on the Sabbath day and lead him away to water. What he's saying is you think more of your animals than you think about people. But I think more about people than I think about the animals. And I'm going to, I didn't come to disqualify. I came to qualify. I came, come on, to set at liberty them that are bruised. I came in to pour the oil and the wine. Remember, this man pours in oil and wine to the wounds of this guy that's wounded. Oil and wine flow from Zion. There's oil and wine in Zion. And Zion is symbolic of the new covenant. Because Hebrews 12 says you did not come to blackness and darkness. You didn't come to Sinai. You didn't come to a God who says stay away. You didn't come to a God who says if you touch the edge of the mountain, you'll be thrust through the dark. But you have come to Mount Zion. And you've come to a feast of gathering of angels. And you've come to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. You've come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. You have come to something far better that doesn't disqualify you. It picks you up in your brokenness while you're bent over to the earth and can't see anything. It encounters a Jesus who isn't a government of condemnation, but a government of affirmation. And he reaches out by the hand and says, stand up right and be loose from your infirmity. Then he finds a man who was disqualified, whose hand was withered. Leviticus said, if your hand was withered, you're disqualified. And he heals a man on the Sabbath who has a withered hand. Blind Bartimaeus, who would have been disqualified under the old covenant, a blind man, starts hollering out, and I love this again, son of David! What he's doing is tapping into a revelation of something bigger than the law of Moses again because he's seeing the Messiah, the king, has now come on the scene that they've all learned about for hundreds of years, and he calls out to that covenant, son of David! And he taps into the sure mercy of David because under the law, they're not, come on, this guy is blind and he's begging. And he comes to Jesus and says, have mercy on me. And they try to push him away. And the more they push him away, the more he cries out. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do? He said, if you want to, you can open my eyes. And he, Jesus said, I, I want to. And he opens his eyes in the blind sea. He finds a leper who was disqualified with a running sore and he heals the running sore. He finds eunuchs that are left. And matter of fact, the Ethiopian was one of the first converts. I understand through history that the Ethiopian uh, that, that Philip met later was the same one that carried the cross of Jesus and became the bishop of North Africa and revolutionized North Africa. I found out the other day that the woman at the well literally preached all, I believe it was, throughout Rome and revolutionized Rome with the gospel of the kingdom, the Samaritan woman at the well. Are you all following with me? The people who you think aren't worth anything is the people Jesus goes to get. Because his first message was he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are bruised. In other words, how many know he is the great physician that comes to heal all of the brokenness of the human family? And there are every one of these miracles that you see Jesus do in the New Testament are not just random miracles. He's trying to show you that everything that disqualified you under the old covenant, I'm going to qualify you. In the new covenant. And I said, God, but what about what about a what about a dwarf? I mean, I mean, if you, if you look through this list, we're all in here somewhere. I said, Lord, what about a dwarf? I mean, you know, the Bible said that, that a dwarf was disqualified. And he said to me, Zacchaeus, 
was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Now, if you read the context, I'm not turning to all of these because we'd be here all day. We could literally develop this for weeks. But the chapter before that, these Pharisees are in the temple and they see this publican and sinner and they point at him and say, I thank God I'm not like that publican and that sinner. See, because I think these Levites and priests that walk to the other side are religious folks that know how to put on a good front. They know how to point out your problems and your faults, but they don't have the answer to remedy your problem. Because religion, come on, is a substitute that does not produce or bring you into life. Only Jesus can do that. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No man can come in except through that door. And so they point at this guy and say, I thank God I'm not like that publican and I'm not like that sinner. And as that chapter goes on down, that same guy who points out his problem, because see, as long as I can keep pointing at your problem. See, we're famous for this. We, we point out the stuff other people are doing that we're not, or at least nobody knows we are. I'm going to try it on this side. Because as long as I can keep my heat on that group of people, that becomes the target, you, you see. And it keeps the heat off of me because then mine's not as bad as that. Y'all tracking with me? So that's what religion does. See, you're looking this morning at a recovering Pharisee. I'm a recovering Pharisee because I used to be that way too. Thank God I'm not like that sinner. Look how holy I am. I glow in the dark. And so this same guy that points out his fault comes to Jesus and he asks the same question this other guy, this other lawyer does. What do I need to do to inherit? Inherit eternal life, the life of the coming age. And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments because this, again, this guy's under the law. You know the commandments. He said, I've done all that from my youth up. Jesus said, then here's what you need to do. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. And the guy went away sad because he was very rich. Couldn't give up a penny under law. Then Jesus, in the next chapter, comes to this dwarf, Zacchaeus. He's the guy they pointed at in the chapter prior to that because it said he was a tax collector, a publican, and he was a sinner, and he was very rich. He's the guy. They were all saying, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. This is so powerful to me. And Jesus said, I'm going to that guy's house because he finds Zacchaeus climbing up in a sycamore tree. If you look the word sycamore up in the original language, it says it's an inferior fig tree. And man, bells and whistles went off. The moment I found out that, he, that Zacchaeus climbed up in an inferior fig tree, my mind immediately went to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, that the fig tree was the leaves that Adam used to cover his nakedness. It was man's attempt to try to make himself look holy. Fig leaves. Everybody say fig leaves. Now fig leaves, apron. He made an apron. Adam made an apron of fig leaves. Here's the problem with an apron. It only covers the front. Don't ever let anybody catch you from behind. Or don't let the sun come out and make them leaves crispy. Fig leaves are the trees of religious self-help programs that most books are written about to try to make you acceptable. Except Jesus says, come down out of that tree. If I could say anything powerful this morning, I'm trying to find a place to land here this morning. I would say to you, come down out of that religious pharisaical tree. And Jesus says to him, I must abide at your house today. Because he goes to be guest, the Pharisees say, of a man who is a sinner. He's the guy they all hate. And Jesus said, that's where I'm going to tie my donkey today. Because I came to seek and to save what was lost. You might be surprised today where you would find Jesus. I told the story about a guy in our church, runs a tattoo parlor in town, got saved. 
And for several years, more people was getting saved at the tattoo parlor than there was up at our church. <laughs> getting filled with the Holy Ghost, water baptized at the tattoo parlor. And he said, would you guys come in and just let my friends ask you questions? We don't know anything about the Bible. He had my son come in and lead worship. Jason would sing and praise us and while he's doing tattoos. People getting saved right and left. My brother filled his church from the tattoo parlor. I wish I could get some help in here this morning. I know y'all, I know some of you still got that pharisaical thing on you. Like, I don't know, yeah, help me, Holy Ghost. Because you thank God you're not like that sinner. And you might be surprised that's where Jesus would tie his donkey at. But sometimes people that are the most broken are the people who've been left bleeding and dying by Levites and priests, a religious system, who so rejected them and so disqualified them that they weren't welcome. And when Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus, he doesn't ask him to do anything. He just simply goes to his house, hang out with him. The most powerful tool of evangelism you can have is go hang out with somebody. Invite somebody to your house to play cards. Well, that's probably, I might not should say that since that used to be a sin too. I don't know where we found that in the Bible, but we did. We preached against that too. Hallelujah. You might find out that once they become friends with you, they're going to ask you, where do you go to church? And especially when they find out you've got a life and not a law. See, the reason our kids don't want to come around is because every time they come around, we want to straighten them out rather than help me hold the ghost. Embrace them. And let, let see, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is to change them. I, let, I promise you this. When Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, when Jesus left, Zacchaeus was different. Because Zacchaeus, Jesus didn't say, Zacchaeus, you got to do this, you got to do that. Zacchaeus never asked him a thing, just invited him. Jesus said, I must abide at your house today because all you wanted from me, Zacchaeus, is you wanted to see Jesus, who he is. And when Jesus goes to his table, he gets there and Zacchaeus says, if I've done anything crooked, I'm going to restore fourfold. I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. Now, remember the guy in the chapter before that can't give a, a penny under law. But under grace, Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. I'm going to restore them. In other words, when Jesus encounters your life, you will change. Come on, stand on your feet all over this building. Let me kind of close with this, this story a little bit. I hope this is ministered to you this morning. And in Luke chapter 14, I believe it is verse 21, it's a story about somebody having a great feast. A certain man made a great feast, and he bade many. And some of them made excuses, and others, now don't, don't start playing just yet, but just give me a moment here. And they made excuses, and Jesus then says to them, but then go out, I love this. The great feast is ready. Touch your neighbor, say the feast is ready. Tell somebody else you're invited. See, he invites folk you don't think he invites. And he invited, and those that were invited first didn't come. But he says, go out into the highways and to the byways. Watch this. Get the halt, the lame, and the blind. Everybody that was disqualified in Leviticus 21. And tell them, you're invited to the supper. You know what's on the table? Somebody said, well, I just can't wait for the Mary's Supper of the Lamb. You know what's for supper? The Mary's Supper of the Lamb? Lamb. Now I'm going to say it from this side. Lamb is what we eat. We feed on the Lamb. It's the covenant meal. This is my body. It was broken for you. It's his brokenness. He dips it. The man who dips his hand in the pot with him is a betrayer. But listen, everyone in this room has been the betrayer. We've all dipped our hand in the pot. But see, he tells that betrayer, this is my body. It was broken for you. He told Peter that. And he told Peter that knowing before the rooster crowed, dude, you're going to betray me. But this is my body. It's broken for you. And I can't help but to think about the story of a character in the Bible by the name of Mephibosheth, who was the great-grandson of King Saul was the son, I believe it was, of Jonathan, whose name was Mephibosheth. He was living in Lodabar, and all of his family had been killed, and he was the last left of the former dynasty. But he was crippled in both of his feet, 
because he was dropped by a midwife at the age of five. All of that will preach, but I'm not going to go into the details. Anybody besides me ever been dropped? Hallelujah. And it crippled you, you know, been rejected. Come on, somebody. All over this room, we all struggle with value and self-esteem and, and feeling like we're worth something. I don't care how successful you are, you still struggle. I've walked on platforms and think to myself, I'm, more, I'm less qualified to be here and maybe not look like it, be, be so intimidated, feel like I don't even belong in this room. Anybody besides me ever felt like that? Maybe you were the last one picked on the baseball team with the two girls. You know, take him and the two girls. You know what I mean? And all of us struggle with that kind of stuff. But see, Mephibosheth was in Lodabar, which means the place of scattering shame. He was ashamed of his family name. And he's hoping, this little crippled boy is hoping that no one will know he's alive. Because what would be the practice of every king who would come into power would be to kill everybody of the former dynasty. That way there's never a chance that you could ever lead an insurrection and overthrow the current king. But King David, I feel the Holy Ghost in here this morning. He gets up one morning. How many know King David is a representative of our greater son of David, King Jesus, is sitting on the throne? I feel the Lord in this place this morning. And King David says, is there anybody left of the household of Saul that I can do good unto him? You may have came in here this morning thinking, boy, God's out to get me, but he sent me to tell you. Is there anybody left that I can do good to them? Is there anybody left? Because Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan, and King David have a covenant between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed. And David remembers his covenant. How I many of King Jesus remembers his covenant? Because in the new covenant, the new covenant is not between God and us. It's between God the Father and God the Son. And we are included in it through the union we have with Christ. So it's an irrevocable covenant, unbreakable covenant. It's a father's hallelujah. I love that. And I promise you the moment the dust of David's chariots and the thump of horses' hooves approached his house, Mephibosheth thought, this, this is it. This is the day I dreaded. This is the big one. I'm, today, I'm all, they're going to kill me. And I promise you, he wasn't in a hurry to get to the palace that day, but he walks into the palace, and he falls down on the floor in front of King David, and he says, what am I but a dead dog in the presence of the king? And King David looks at him and says, Mephibosheth, I didn't bring you here to kill you. I came to give you back all your father's inheritance. I came to tell somebody this morning, God's not out to get you. Whew. He wants to give you back your father's inheritance. He just wants to invite you to his table to eat the bread of God, no matter how crippled you are. And he looks at Mephibosheth and he said, Mephibosheth, I didn't bring you here to kill you. I, I brought you here to give you back all your father's inheritance. And he says, Furthermore, you ain't even going to have to work in your fields. I'm going to give you servants, and they're going to bring in your goods. All I want you to do, Mephibosheth, all I want you to do is sit at my table the rest of your days. I want you to come as one of my sons and sit down and just have dinner with me. I just want you to come and dine. Isn't it amazing? That's what Jesus did right after his resurrection to all the betrayers. He's on the bank. Come and dine. Got bread and fish on the fire. I just want you to come to the table. That's, see, what we do is we try to get people straightened out before we ever give them an encounter with Jesus. But I promise you, if you come to his table and you start feeding on lamb, something's going to hit you like it did in Egypt. So I can't live in this bondage anymore. And I can promise you this. David probably said to his sons and to his staff, now whatever you do, don't make fun of his crippled feet. And whatever you do, don't look under the table. Touch your neighbor, tell him, don't look under the table. Don't look under the table for people's crippledness. You know what you're going to find if you look under the table? Everybody at the table is crippled. Every single one of us. Somebody said to me one time, you guys are preaching grace because there's sin in your life. I said, you better believe it. <laughs> People are tired of the, the fake stuff. They're looking for something authentic. Listen, man, I keep coming to the table every day because I feel like when I feed on the Lamb of God, 
it makes me qualified. And in the fellowship of that arrangement, I start to heal. I start to get better. And later in the story, Mephibosheth, it talks about he has a son. So something must have started working from the waist down. Hallelujah. God restored him. I want you to get ready to sing something. I don't know how, how to end a service like this. This to me is so powerful because no matter how broken you are, no matter how wounded you felt, no matter what, people are so disenfranchised, I think, with a religious system that just walks across the road and leaves them bleeding and dying because it knows how to diagnose the problem, but it doesn't know how to bring the